afternoon and welcome to our propeller event in association with IT at Cork Tech Fest, Cognitive Performance and Developing Insights for the Tech Entrepreneur. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Des Golden. Um, before I introduce Des and before I introduce the event, I'd like to firstly introduce myself. My name is Fiona Ryan. I am the Startup and Entrepreneurship Manager with the Ludgate Hub here in Skibbereen. A little bit about Ludgate. Ludgate opens, it opened its doors in 2016. And in 2019, we embarked on our roadmap of program development. That program development was around education in both primary, secondary, and adult, ed, 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 adult education sphere, and also within the startup and entrepreneurship side of things, developing out supports to uh, encourage entrepreneurship in our region. The ultimate culmination of all of that activity has been uh, the generation of 350 jobs in our region, and the knock on econ economic impact associated with that is 4 million. So we're delighted at Ludgate to be hosting this event in association with IT at Cork, uh, the Tech Festival. Of course, that's running all week um, and the flagship event was yesterday, uh, a sellout event. So a hearty congratulations to all of the IT at Cork team and thank you for including Ludgate in your regional rollout of these events. Um, of course, at Ludgate, we're very proud to be supporting and being part of those tech and tech enabled organizations creating an ecosystem of support and developing this particular sector for the Southwest region. It ties into our vision and our mission here in Ludgate. Okay, so before I eat into Des's time, I'm going to introduce Des and a little bit scripted now for this one. So uh, Des Golden, I suppose I've got to know Des over the last number of months. Uh, we've been working together on another project um, and I've really enjoyed working with Des uh, so far. Fantastic presenter. Um, so Des facilitates leaders, entrepreneurs, and teams from around the world to better their performance. After spending time lecturing in physical education and coaching at the Rafa Nadal Academy in Spain, he studied the neuroscience of coaching and the Neuro Leadership Institute. Des is a mindfulness practitioner and is a qualified health coach with Precision Nutrition Canada. He facilitates health and well-being seminars and workshops for clients in the UK and Ireland. And he is also a member of the International Coaching Federation. And of course, we were all very je jealous on LinkedIn yesterday when you posted one of your workshops with a UK client from beautiful Ibiza. Although I do think that West Cork could be on par with that in the summer months once we get fine weather. Uh, so in terms of what he will be pre presenting on today, um, he's looking at cognitive performance and the developing of insights for the tech entrepreneur. This is part of Des's peak performance series of which there are a number of modules and cognitive performance is one of those particular modules. And he's gonna help us to understand how we can create the right conditions uh, for our brain to have more insights that leads to an increase in motivation, an increase in performance, an improvement in performance. And of course, if all of that happens and it comes together, that should equal success. So on that note, I'm gonna hand it over to, I hand you over to Des. Thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, this day is golden, sounds like an amazing guy. <laughs> Lovely introduction. Uh, thanks to yourself and to Kieran Collins as well, uh, an old friend, and to Ludgate for the, the invitation. So I'm delighted to spend some time here, uh, and it's particularly the, the association at West Cork is kind of a place close to my heart. Uh, I spent a lot of my summers in Bantry, so I'm delighted to be here and um, I hope everyone gets something out of the presentation. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get going. Super, so the title is Cognitive Performance and Insights for the Tech Entrepreneur. Um, and this is a module or a, a subject taken out from a, a larger program that we deliver to different companies across Europe, the Peak Performance Series. So we, we look at uh, performance through the lens of neuroscience and they're kind of bespoke programs depending on the pain points of the different organization so we're going to look at cognitive performance today and uh, neuroscience and neuro leadership is coming fast becoming a really really kind of an important area um, within leadership and um, you know so I'm, I'm kind of excited to kind of share a lot of the kind of the recent developments in this area with you and I'm a conduit uh, for a lot of this uh, information uh, developed by neuroscientists and other people so I, I, I think I should give credit to the Neuroleadership Institute in particular David Rock uh, a lot of this is their work um, now I apply it through my my business and my coaching uh, but really they're the brains behind it so the agenda today we're just going to look at what, what actually are insights? Okay, that's the first thing. Then we're going to look at 
well, how do we create the conditions then to increase the likelihood of more insights happening? And finally, then I just leave you with a couple of practical takeaways, things that you can apply immediately to increase the likelihood of, your, of yourself having more insights. So um, this is a, a riddle, uh, H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. And uh, I don't want you to type into the chat box if you know what it is already. Uh, I want you to see if you can figure out what this means. Uh, what does this refer to? If you can, if you, could, if you can figure it out as you're looking at it, type insight into the chat box. If you already know and you've seen it before, don't type anything, okay? Um, so this is a problem now we're faced with, okay? We're trying to fix this problem. And we need maybe a bit of creativity, a bit of innovation to try and fix this. Um, we might be using you know, the same methodology to try and fix this problem. You might be working with your acronym maps, for example, and you're repeatedly trying to figure out well, what is this. And after a time then, you, know, you might experience some frustration and you get stuck and you experience what we call an impasse. And you know, in our work, uh, in our entrepreneurial work, if you're an executive, uh, how you get past these kind of blocks are, can be you know, massive. Uh, they can determine the success we have uh, in our businesses and in our work. So H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. Now, you're probably trying to solve this consciously, you know, using the acronym maps, as I've said. There is another way to solve it. There's another way to find the solution. And that is via insight. So can I just uh, ask people in the chat box, what comes up for you when you hear the word insight? What do you associate it with? Intuition, great. Yeah, the unconscious, fantastic, yeah. More understanding, depth of knowledge on a topic, new learning, super, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of those things there. Um, here's a scientific definition from the Neuro Leadership, Neuro Leadership Institute. It, they describe it as a non-obvious solution that comes from our, our non-conscious. It emerges suddenly into awareness and it combines existing data in a new way. So that's a kind of a fancy way of saying the aha moment, okay? Um, all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to solve a problem or get the solution and boom, it happens, okay? The penny drops and the light bulb goes off. It emerges suddenly into our awareness from our non-conscious. And then we combine new data that we have stored in our minds, in our brains, in a new way to form a new concept and ultimately, ultimately then to uh, figure out a solution. And they can be so impactful when we have insights. Just to give you a couple of examples of one example, Percy Spencer uh, was working with the US Navy and he was working with a magnetron um, machine, uh, which relates to uh, radar. And he had a bar of chocolate in his pocket. So I'm assuming Percy had a sweet tooth as well. And a, the chocolate started to melt. So he noticed this and he, he ran away and he got some uh, popcorn kernels and brought the popcorn back beside the magnetron and boom, they started to pop. And so from that, a, the first microwave was developed. So that was a, just an example of an insight that he had that completely changed, you know, uh, how we prepare food. So pretty significant. So just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, what an insight feels like, uh, we can just play a little game here. And it's a word association game, which they use a lot in kind of insight research. So you have to connect the three words laterally uh, with a connector word. So cottage, Swiss, and cake. That's obviously then uh, cottage cheese, Swiss cheese, and um, cheesecake. So uh, again, into the chat box, uh, it'll be good if you interact with this. Fish, mine, and rush. What connects those? Gold, good stuff. Gavin, quick off the mark there. Excellent. Um, and the next one, a shoulder war and sweat. Cold, okay. Cold, shoulder, cold war, cold sweat. Brilliant. Uh, cork, 
Wing and Life, Super, West Cork, West Wing and West Life. And finally, a uh, slipped jockey and compact disc. Okay, super duper. So what's happening there is these are kind of um, low level problems. And when we see the problem, a solution arrives and we have great confidence in the solution when it arrives. We know what it is straight away. And that's our brains uh, connecting data that we have stored in different ways. That's what's happening there. Um, and just to kind of touch on the small bit of the neuroscience of this, we have five different brain waves. Um, and the two most associated with uh, insight is the alpha and gamma. So the alpha wave is responsible really for it's kind of it's active when we're at idle. So, you know, when we're kind of relaxed, almost like a car in neutral, the engine is on, but we're just ticking over. There's no kind of forcing there. And Due to advances in um, neuroscience, they were able to do some uh, neuroimaging, which gives us a, a kind of a more information understanding on what happens during the moment or just prior to the, to the moment of insight. So the, there's an increase in alpha activity. And what's happening there is a thing called sensory gating. So the brain is cutting out information and stimulus from external sources. So we might kind of close our eyes when people are having insight, they might look up to the right, they might look down at their shoes. And then what happens is a burst of gamma activity, the gamma brainwave. And this means that there are different parts, different regions of the brain are communicating together at the same time. That's what gamma means. Now, the thing about the gamma uh, signal, is it's very, very weak and it's hard to hear. So how then do we create the conditions and uh, increase the likelihood of hearing the brain having insight? So what are the conditions for insight? So the first one, we need quiet moments. Uh, we need to reduce our brain activity. Um, if we have a lot of brain activity going on, we're less likely to hear uh, the gamma wave. Um, you know, someone described it as like being at a party when you're inside in a room and there's a lot of chatter and there's music playing and there's a phone ringing in the room next door. It's kind of very subtle. It's hard to hear. So we need to provide quiet moments so that our brains can pick up on these insights. And then we need to be inwardly focused. So that's why we close our eyes or we don't like sound. You know, stop, turn off the music. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. You'd often hear people say that a lot. So uh, through coaching, you can ask certain types of questions that increase the likelihood of people uh, having insight and get them to reflect internally on their thinking, their metacognition. The next one is uh, to limit threat. So psychological safety is a big, big thing now for uh, performance. We need to kind of feel safe uh, because if we're threatened or anxious, um, well, our brain is very noisy then, you know, there's lots of music in the room, so to speak, and we can't hear what's going on. Uh, so we need to be in a positive mood, slightly happy, and there's a bit of dopamine then, which will be associated with that. And that in increased the likelihood of us having uh, insights and critically uh, hearing them. And lastly then, uh, believe it or not, is to, when you're trying to solve a problem, the best thing in some cases is to step away from it and, and leave it leave it rest. Um, so to reduce conscious attempts to solve problems. Sleep is a great circuit breaker. So the problem I gave you at the start, H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O, you're better off leaving that aside now and coming back to it later uh, because it breaks the circuit of your conscious brain consistently trying the same method to solve the problem. Now you apply that to your work. Uh, you know, you're trying to increase sales in a downturn in the economy. You're trying to expand your business when, or your, your startup when you have no resources. You know, these problems can be quite significant. Sometimes when we step away from them, the answer comes rushing to us quite suddenly via insight. So they're the kind of key conditions uh, at a high level for insight, okay? And um, so again, it'd be, it'd be interesting to hear in the chat, you know, when do you guys have your best ideas? When do you generally have your insights? What are you doing?
driving yeah so we relax just before sleep it's so a lot of creative people sleep with a notebook beside their beds because they have great ideas just after waking up cycling walking look at this when i'm out running this is fantastic what connects all these ideas is it's not at work um G gallop somewhere where i haven't gone i got in a book with me somewhere where i haven't got a book with me okay in the morning time morning time for me as well in the shower yeah certainly fantastic so all of these what what connects all of these is it's not at work and we often try to maybe if we're managers or executives we, we try to uh, well, not force, we try to encourage our teams to brainstorm at work and maybe make sure they're at work between certain hours. Gallup and your leadership institute say that, you know, they did a significant study and they found that only 10% of people reported having their best ideas at work, um, which is pretty significant. And there's a lot of implications there for hybrid remote working. Um, so it's when we're doing, we're relaxed and generally doing repetitive movements that boom, the insight comes. I had one two days ago, actually, I was doing um, some work with a company in Ibiza and I was, you know, I like metaphor a lot. And I was trying to teach about how the sunrise and the sunset is, it sets our circadian rhythm and we should be trying to get up at the sunrise and going to bed with the sunset or generally near enough to the sunset. So next thing, this boom, traffic light came into my mind. Ah, it's like the traffic light. So green sunset is like the green for go, and the sunrise and the sun or sunrise would be green for go, and the sunset would be kind of red for stop. So start your day, stop your day. Now, obviously, in modern modern times, maybe the sun the sunset is more of a kind of amber. So that was an insight I had, and I had it while I was driving. So uh, Mark Beeman uh, does a lot of research in this area. And you know, the question then is like, who are the people that have the insights? Who are the insight machines? Who are these uh, people? Are they the, the geniuses? Are they the people that are working the hardest? And they're not. He says, you know, if you just want to read this quote yourself. So the key part here of this, for me anyway, is those who have more awareness of their internal experience. And that makes sense. They can hear the phone ringing in the next room. They can hear that gamma wave exploding when different regions of the brain combine information in a new way. Um, and this obviously makes, you know, this tells us why there's been a surge in people practicing mindfulness to improve their performance at work. So uh, there are the kind of conditions for insight. Um, what we look at now maybe is just uh, the kind of final section of this. So what are the practical takeaways? Uh, what can we do to maybe implement some of this theory here? So the first one is move often. Um, I love this image. It really kind of sums up, uh, you know, what, what the benefits of walking. Humans have become, um, we've evolved to become long distance walkers rather than kind of gym bunnies or, or even sprinters. And, you know, the mind body connection is just, it's amazing. And the more we move, the better it is for our minds. And we probably have more insights if we can integrate this into our day. So instead of being at the desk, you know, all day long, which is quite attractive if you're anxious and you're trying to solve problems, you need a bit of discipline to get up and move and walk and your, your mind will think it will thank you for it after and you're more likely to you're increase the likelihood of your insights. Cognitive diet, you know, distraction. We live in an attention economy and there's constant pinging of the cell phone, mobile phone and the Internet and, and uh, our windows and our email. So we need to try and reduce distraction um, and be very careful about what we introduce into our, I suppose, our, our consciousness, in, particularly in the mornings when we are more creative generally. So are, you know, are we listening to podcasts? Are we scroll, scrolling Twitter and Facebook? Any creative work in the morning, I'd probably try and limit uh, this type of activity. 
So downtime is really important. When we're relaxed, a lot of insights come to us. Uh, when we're relaxed, we have positive mood, as I referred to earlier. So planning for downtime is very, very important. And of course, practicing mindfulness. Um, you know, awareness is the big thing now. The more aware we are of our experience and our internal experience in particular, generally the better, kind of more fulfilled lives we lead. Uh, we're generally better managers and better workers. And as I said earlier, we, um, we increase the likelihood of hearing those gamma waves and hearing those insights. And finally then coaching is a fantastic way. I see a lot of my clients have insights and it's quite rewarding to see it. When you ask them a the question, they look up and boom, their face lights up and they just realize something to be true. And they've, you know, uh, they've unblocked themselves and they've moved past that impasse that they're experiencing. But also then as well, integrating coaching, if you're an executive or a manager, integrating that into your practice, which is a really big team at the moment, uh, using coaching skills to help your teams kind of solve their own problems rather than them become reliant on you for advice and they become more independent then as a result. So uh, they're kind of a, just a kind of a, a, qu a quick um, synopsis of what insights are um, uh, how do we create conditions for insights to happen and then some practical takeaways then of what we can do to ap apply this into our lives to increase the likelihood of them happening. H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. So this is a riddle that uh, means a certain thing. Did anybody manage to solve it uh, over the last 10 minutes if you haven't seen it before? If you have, uh, feel free to type into the chat box. Brilliant. Fantastic. Okay. So did you just solve that there, Norma, as it came up? Yes, with the help of another person. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Yeah. So you probably had an insight then when you saw that. It felt good. You had a little release of dopamine and yeah. H2O. Uh, so a lot of us might have been using the same logical linear, linear problem solving approach to solve that. If we leave it be, it'll come back to us via insight. And they are extremely impactful. And knowing how to create the conditions for insights to happen, and then having the discipline to integrate them into our week uh, can have a massive impact on how we work and ultimately on the results we achieve. So um, I'll, I'll just leave you with this one here. You know, It's no longer really about the hours that we put in. Uh, it's more about the quality of our insights. So uh, thanks very much for, for listening and um, I hope you've gotten something out of this. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, please shout. Thanks very much, Des. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them into chat or you can unmute yourself um, and, and pose your questions. Um, I just think in terms of the conditions for insights, I think I've learned a great deal there and it makes sense. Um, it's not until you know, you actually verbalize them, Des, that it all kind of clicks. You know, um, we're doing this ourselves. Um, we don't know that we're doing them, or we don't necessarily think along the lines of right. This is the appropriate condition for me to have an idea. Um, and again, like for me, it was definitely either running. Um, sometimes I must say, the odd time um, when you are talking collectively, things can come out of a team meeting. You take them away, you sit down in a quiet space, and then you start teasing it out yourself in your mind. Um, and it gets me thinking about how corporate ideation days work, because that's obviously you're imposing a structure on, on employees um, to, to come up with uh, these ideas in a formalized setting when it's not, not actually necessarily the best setting, that mm. it could be away from the ideation day you're collecting the ideas, maybe somehow within the organization, and you're bringing them along to a session where people can start to debate and tease them out. 
What yeah. would you think of that kind of approach, Des? Because we see all of these ideation days taking on um, a life of their own now because, you know, people are working away from the office and people, so companies are trying to bring people together on these mm. ideation days. But, uh, you know, if you look at the conditions for insights, it's actually not maybe the most appropriate model. Well, I, I think uh, what you said there is the combination is important. You know, it's it, like sometimes when we change, when the pendulum swings, it tends to swing hard to the other extreme. So the hybrid option, I think, makes more sense to me. Some things can come, some good things can come from brainstorming and the ideation days, as you said, but also just facilitating people to step away from it and um, have time to kind of have their own insights. Fantastic. Okay, we have a question here from Michael. Uh, okay, are there studies you're aware of which indicate how coffee affects brain waves more than others? No, Michael, I don't have anything on the the link between caffeine and brain waves. No. And another one there. Okay. Yeah, employers are they open to the idea of this? Uh, Google, for example, they've you know a lot of. Uh, they put a big emphasis on this and they play areas, for example, when we're at play, we're, you know, releasing dopamine and that can be one of the conditions for insight as well. It's a hard sell for employers um, because they, 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 it takes a special type of leader to kind of maybe break the mold and do something different. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of security that comes to them when they see people are kind of there nine to five and they're doing the kind of the old traditional way. Um, it depends on the person. I think slowly um, more people are starting to kind of maybe open up to this idea as more neuroscience kind of emerges into, um, you know, how we work better and work, uh, emerges into the mainstream. In terms then of sensory environments, sensory rooms, um, I suppose we've, we've always seen sensory rooms for kids. Um, now they're more prevalent in uh, adult settings as well. Do they operate in the same way that you could go into a sensory room? Um, it's that quiet space. Uh, does that speak to the gamma? It could, yeah, certainly would help. Uh, and also, I think, uh, Fiona, our, our, our attention, when we're, when we're quite anxious and threatened, our focus really narrows mm. and we can't see the broader picture and we can't have good insights when that happens. So uh, our vision and our eyes, ideally your office is looking at a window and out into nature, that would be the bonus. Uh, because the, vi the vistas in nature tend to be quite panoramic. And that's a broad focus. And that's really, really good for, for insight creation and um, relaxation and insight creation. So yeah, uh, in sensory rooms, definitely would help. Everyone is different. They all have different preferences. But the big thing is to reduce distraction. Yes. Uh, and that's, sure that's the, the problem nowadays, is that we're so connected, whether it be the watch, or the phone or the laptop, um, we're constantly on, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it's it's us actually stepping away and um, putting these devices down and creating that window for ourselves to have the opportunity and create the conditions ourselves for insights. Big time. In terms of the appropriate, one of your conditions for insights is uh, downtime, planning downtime. So whether that be a holiday or stepping away from the office setting for a certain period of time, what is the optimum number of days I always find if I'm only stepping out of the office and going maybe on a city break for a day or two sometimes I feel like that's all go 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 and yeah. it's not giving me the downtime I'm not relaxing I'm not allowing the brain to relax so is there um is there a certain number of days that you need to is there any evidence behind that yeah just before I address that just going back to the distraction just one interesting one for you for your phone to have no impact on your attention not only does it have to be off, but it has to be in a different room. So okay. that's amazing. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's from David Rock. It has to be off and it has to be in a different room. So to bring it forward then to the, the downtime, I think the big thing really is how you define downtime. So uh, watching Netflix for the brain is not really downtime. Uh, doing the dishes and listening to a true crime podcast, that's not downtime. Just doing the dishes is downtime. Now, uh, for some men, doing the dishes is infuriating. That's probably not downtime. Going for a walk is downtime. Um, meditation is not downtime, uh, believe it or not. It can be quite relaxing, but there's a conscious effort there to bring your mind to the present. So how we define downtime is quite important. Doodling 
is downtime. Looking out the window and daydreaming is downtime. So allowing your mind to daydream is kind of quite important for these insights to happen as well. So rather than the time for downtime, a, I think it's the definition of it is probably more uh, appropriate. Okay, okay. Yeah. And just one other question there. Um, you spoke about mindfulness as well. How do you achieve that? <laughs> I have to, I've tried it a few times <clears throat> and it starts out great. And the next thing, all of, all of the work that I need to do floods in. So yeah. how do I keep that there? Focus on the mindfulness um, and kind of shut down the mind for a little while. Well, that, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And, you know, monks are working on this all their lives and they're still struggling with it. Um, I think that the key thing with mindfulness is it's integration, you know, um, I, 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 I'm interested in nutrition and movement as well. And I came up with a kind of a, a phrase recently that meditation is to, is to mindfulness as dieting is to nutrition, as exercise is to movement. They're all kind of um, maybe, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're kind of contrived, I suppose, is the word. So it's lovely to do a mindfulness meditation for 10 or 15 minutes. And then, you know, you go and do your task and you fall over and you're, you're not present to what you're doing. So it takes, um, it takes a lot of practice uh, to just to try to focus on what you're doing in the moment. Um, and I suppose formal practices like the kind of 10 minute, 20 minute meditation uh, can help. But it's when we leave that, then it's to be kind of aware and conscious of and to be present to whatever it is we're doing. So it's, um, I've no magic bullet, I've no magic answer. It's practice, I would say. Certain personalities find it easier than others, for sure. Um, but uh, I would say stay with it and, and practice. Okay, okay. So that's, that's my task. I need to improve that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Des. Uh, is there any other questions from anybody else on the call? And today's um, presentation is recorded and it will be available on our website. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Des for taking time out of his busy schedule to present a fantastic presentation. Thank you for taking an awful lot away. Um, and I now know that there's an awful lot I need to do as well. Um, really impressed with Norma as well in the Enterprise Centre there uh, in figuring out uh, that it was water. Um, so fantastic. Congratulations, Norma. And, um, and so thank you once again, Des. Thanks to all the team um, behind the scenes at Ludgate Hub. Um, thank you to IT at Cork as well for inviting us to be part of their tech festival and congratulations on the success of it this year. And, um, and we'll see you all again, hopefully soon for another Propeller event. Thanks a million, Fiona. Thanks, Thanks very much for tuning in. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.